So hopefully people came up with a few suggestions about uh, what it would take to convince them of this sort of claim. Now, this is a really nice example because it, it brings in a few of the ideas that we were talking about previously, about what you would include in the experimental design, how you could use experiments and science to inform everyday decision making. And one of the things, I mean, if you put yourself into that position, what would it take to convince you? If, if, if I prepared a cup of tea um, behind myself here, and I had uh, tea and I added a little bit of milk, and I gave it to you, and asked you, did I add the milk to the tea or the tea to the milk? And you were correct. Um, I don't think I'd be terribly convinced. I don't know whether you were actually just guessing or whether you could legitimately, truly tell the difference between milk added first or second. Better, probably, I think, would be if I had two cups of tea, one with milk added first, one with milk added second, and then gave them to you and shuffled them around maybe, and you had a sip of each, and then made a guess. So that's two, but even still, I don't think that's terribly convincing. And I think people probably share the same sort of intuition. How many cups of milk, uh, how many cups of tea, and how many of these sorts of things would it take to convince you that someone can tell the difference between tea added first or tea added second? Is it two, is it three, is it four, is it five? How many would it take to say, okay, I believe you. I think something's actually happening here. Well, if we go back to Ronald Fisher's case, the way that he set it up was he had eight cups of tea. So he had eight cups of tea, four of the eight had milk added first, four of them had milk added second. And he told the woman that this was gonna be the case. We'll set this up, we have four here, four here, and we'll prepare these for you. And I'm going to hide which of these are which, and I'll present them to you. Uh, one at a time, you can taste them, and then you have to guess whether it's milk first or milk second. Now, one of the important elements here is that he would have to present them randomly. Now, if you think back to episode three, where we were talking about the stocking task, where people had a very um, right-handed bias in selecting the stockings that they preferred, then the same thing could be happening here. If you just had, for example, all of the milk firsts on the right, all the tea firsts on the left, people might just choose the one uh, and say all of the ones on the right are milk first. And so in order to account for that, what you need to do is shuffle them up. You need to present them randomly but, uh, to the woman. But what do you mean by randomly? Because we've just learned that, that we're quite terrible at coming up with random sequences. So if, if you were to give the, the eight teacups to the woman in a sort of random order that you came up with, you might just choose uh, milk first, tea first, milk first, tea first. And she, being, being the same at, at picking up these non-random things, might go milk first, tea first, milk first, tea first. And she would do that same random order. So it would look like she's responding correctly, but actually she's just picking up on the same sort of non-randomness that, 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 that you created. That's exactly right. And in fact, Ronald Fisher pointed that out, not explicitly pointing that out, but he suggested when selecting this random sequence that you use some sort of objective device like a coin flip or uh, the roll of a dice or cards or uh, I can't remember, something like uh, things that you would normally use in games of chance yeah, uh, to be able to do that. Generator. A random number table, he actually said, because at the time they had those. And so, exactly. And so you would present these randomly to the woman, and she would have a sip, and then she would make a guess as to whether it was milk first or tea first. And he had 80 of these cups. Now, I don't want to get into the mathematics, but one of the elements that we want to highlight here is that he had eight cups of tea, of which four were milk first, four were tea first, and she had to get... Um, a sufficient number correct in order for people around the table to believe her. But the question is, what is that number? What would it take to convince people around the table that, that she got it right? Well, what if she got two of the eight right, three out of the eight? Well, he didn't actually say in the experiment when he wrote this up in the chapter, he didn't actually say how many she got correct. But imagine that she got all eight correct, that she could correctly distinguish between the uh, cups of tea with the milk added first and the milk added second. How, how strange is that? Well, there's eight cups of tea. I mean, again, I don't want to get into mathematics here, but if you were to actually calculate the way uh, the possible, the, all of the possible ways of doing that, there are about 70 
ways of making a choice in that scenario, but only one way of getting it correct. So there's a one in 70 chance, which is pretty unlikely, that she would be able to do that by, by chance, or that she would be able to guess correctly without any sort of capa real capability of doing that. So it seems that that's sufficiently weird, sufficiently um, unlikely to be able to say that, well, hang on, maybe there is something here. But you could set that criterion wherever you'd like. It's not just eight cups. You could demand nine cups or 10 cups or 20 cups. If you had 20 cups that she had to guess, all 20 correct before you believed her, the, the possibilities of doing that are about, I don't know, one in 5,000, I think, of doing that correctly by just guessing alone, which is, it's pretty unlikely. Uh, I would, I'd be pretty inclined to say that she can do what she claims if she guessed all 20 correct, or even eight, uh, eight of those correct. So I think that's a really nice example of the experimental method. And, and highlighting this idea of fishiness, of, of lumpiness in chance. Yep, uh, that's exactly what scientists do um, every day. They're, they're designing experiments and they're trying to figure out uh, whether there's anything strange going on here. And you and I are actually cognitive scientists. Uh, that's how we spend most of our days. And, and we, some of the things we've been working on in our lab is testing claims such as fingerprint identification. So there are people who testify in court, usually police officers, about whether a crime scene print matches a suspect or not. They're called fingerprint experts, but do they have genuine expertise? Are they better at any better at matching prints than you and I are? We'll find out in episode 10. <laughs> cool, yeah. Another one uh, that, uh, that a colleague of ours, Wen Wu, is working on is whether honeybees can tell the difference between artwork by Picasso and artwork by Monet. Uh, something else we've been working on is that that flashed uh, face distortion effect that we saw in episode two where the faces look uh, strange and distorted. We've been trying to manipulate ways to, to strengthen or, or to, to exacerbate that effect what, and what creates it. So again, we're just, we're, we're setting up experiments and trying to convince ourselves and our colleagues and, and everybody else uh, that, that there's something going on here or, or maybe not. And something, one claim that's really interesting me at the moment is uh, wine expertise or wine taste testing. So there've been a few articles in the popular press very recently uh, kind of saying, there's actually nothing to this. Like wine tasting is, is junk. People can't tell the difference between cheap and expensive wine or even red and white wine. And there might not be anything to uh, wine expertise. So I spoke to Tony Mantanakis about exactly this. Yeah.